everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over respiratory acidosis. I'm actually doing a series on acid and base imbalances, so if you're studying that right now be sure to check out those videos. Now in the previous video I went over respiratory alkalosis and showed you the differences, how it affects the body, what to remember for the NCLEX exam and your nursing lecture exam, so be sure to check out that video. So in this video, what I'm going to do is I am going to simplify the pathophysiology with what's going on in respiratory acidosis. I'm going to give you a mnemonic on how to remember the causes, and we're going to go over signs and symptoms, nursing interventions, and then I'm going to take it a step further and work a arterial blood gas problem with a patient that's in respiratory acidosis and show you how to set the problem up using the tic-tac-toe method and how you can determine if it's compensated and not compensated and things things like that. Now after this video, be sure to go to my website registerednursern.com and take the free quiz that will test your knowledge on respiratory alkalosis and respiratory acidosis. A card should be popping up or a link in the description below and you can access that free quiz. So let's get started with the pathophysiology because in order to truly understand what's going on in the body during respiratory acidosis, you have to know what is being affected in the lungs. Then the causes will make sense. It'll literally be like common sense and it'll click in your brain. So let's simplify this. Okay, whenever you breathe, you take in oxygen through your either your nose or your mouth. So the oxygen enters in through there, the pharynx area. Then it goes down through the larynx, which is your throat, down through the trachea, which branches off into the bronchus, which then branches off into the bronchioles, and then to the alveolar sacs. Now the alveolar sacs is where everything, the gas exchanges are happening. And what happens is that oxygen enters in and carbon dioxide comes out because carbon dioxide is that buildup of whatever your body has left over and you're gonna breathe that out. So the carbon dioxide will go backwards of how the oxygen in entered and it will exit through your nose or through your mouth. Now in those alveolar sacs, what's happening is oxygen is going into those sacs, carbon dioxide's coming out, oxygen's attaching to the red blood cells. The red blood cells are transporting it throughout your body to your organs, to your tissues, and giving it fresh supply of oxygen. But whenever you have something that's interrupting the breathing, either you have depressed respirations where um, maybe you gave them an opioid, they have too much drugs involved or something like that, it causes depressed breathing, they're not expelling the CO2. So anything that's affecting the body's ability to breathe normally, because in an adult, normal respirations are 12 to 20 breaths per minute. So if it's less than 12, they're not breathing appropriately. So they're not expelling the CO2. And we'll go over the causes a lot more in depth. And your diaphragm, which is below your lungs, plays a role in this as well. So if you have anything that affects the diaphragm, which in neuromuscular diseases, which we'll go over here in a second, that can affect because whenever you breathe in, diaphragm goes up, helps squeeze that air out, squeeze out carbon dioxide out, and then it relaxes. So if you have anything affecting that, that can cause problems. So whenever you have the buildup of the CO2, this causes your blood pH to become acidic. And here are some key concepts that you need to remember for this disease process that your teachers will probably ask you on exams or on the NCLEX. So let's look at these key concepts. Okay, overall respiratory acidosis is the buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood. And it's mainly due to bradypenia, which brady means slow, penia deals with respiration. So you're having really slow respirations where you're not getting rid of that carbon dioxide. And what happens? Carbon dioxide's in your body, there's too much of it, and your body's like, oh, we do not like this. So your blood pH, because of that carbon dioxide, causes the blood to become very acidic. And it will become a pH of less than 7.35. And you remember, you have a lot of CO, carbon dioxide, CO2, hanging around. So the levels are gonna increase. So anything greater than 45. Now, whenever this happens in the body, remember your body loves homeostasis. It loves to keep everything nice and equal. So it'll use other systems of the body to try to regulate this out. 
So the kidneys will actually start to release bicarbonate, HCO3. And you will start to see these levels rise. And the reason that they're trying to rise is to help decrease that pH, help to increase that pH level to make it normal because right now it's decreased and they want to increase it. So by releasing the bicarb, it will help hopefully increase it. And any levels greater than 26, if you see that in a blood gas, that's what your body's trying to do. It's trying to compensate with that. Now, you want to memorize these lab values. You seriously just want to commit these to memory so you can understand what's going on because whenever you're solving blood gas levels or anything like that, you're going to have to refer back into your memory, hey, what's normal, what's acidotic, what's not. So let's go over it real fast. A normal pH level is 7.35 to 7.45. A normal PaCO2 level, your carbon dioxide level, is 35 to 45. How I remember these two, remember the fives at the end, 7.35 to 7.45. And then again, PaCO2 is 35 to 45. You see the three and the five and the four and the five. And then the HCO3, which is your bicarb, the normal is 22 to 26. And then I just have this little chart. This helps me remember it if it's, if it's an acid or not an acid. And for pH, anything acid right here, anything less than 7.35 is an acid. Anything greater than 7.45 is a base, alkalotic. And pCO2 it is the opposite. So the high number, anything greater than 45 is acidotic. And anything less than 35 is um, alkalotic. And bicarb, anything less than 22 is acidotic. And anything greater than 26 is alkalotic. So just try to remember that because that's going to help us whenever we try to solve our blood gases. And I'm going to show you how to do that using the tic-tac-toe method. Okay, so let's go over the causes of respiratory acidosis. Okay, remember this mnemonic, the word depress, depressed breathing, because that is one of the big reasons why your body is becoming acidotic, why you're having that buildup of CO2. So remember the word depress, and each word will correlate with what's what the cause is. Okay, first, drugs. Any drugs such as opiates, which are morphine, fentanyl, questions like to throw that out at you, say the patient overdosed on morphine or fentanyl or something like that, or any sedatives such as Versed, that's a lot of times given during moderate sedate, sedation, will cause respiratory depression. And remember, when the patient is breathing less than 12 breaths per minute, they're just barely breathing and they're not expelling that CO2. That CO2 is building up. So that can cause respiratory acidosis. So you want to watch patients with that. Also, the other D, diseases of the neuromuscular system. I talked about this at the beginning. This is the myasthenia gravis or Guillain-Barre syndrome. And this is weakness of the voluntary muscles like the diaphragm, which helps to squeeze that carbon dioxide out. And in these syndromes, they're not working properly, so they can't expel that carbon dioxide. It's hanging around in there. Okay, E, edema. Anytime you get extra fluid in these lungs, like in pulmonary edema, um, especially with congestive heart failure patients, that fluid is hanging around those sacs. And remember in the alveolar sacs, we talked about how there's a gas exchange between oxygen and carbon dioxide and it messes up those sacs. Those sacs can't open and close properly. So it just starts to retain the CO2. So that can cause it. Next, pneumonia. Almost the same concept as the fluid. With pneumonia, you have that excessive mucus production around those sacs, which is, and your sacs are filled with pus and fluid, and they're not able to even properly inflate and deflate. So you have that buildup of that carbon dioxide that your body is trying to get rid of. So pneumonia can cause it. And the rest, next one, the R, Respiratory center of the brain is damaged. Okay, in your brain, you have the medulla and the pons area. That is responsible for your respiratory center. Now, if you have any traumatic brain injury or you have a stroke that affect that affects that area, that can affect the way that the patient breathes, how they take breath, so they can develop respiratory acidosis. Okay, E for emboli. 
And this can block the pulmonary artery or the branches of the lungs, depending on where the emboli left the body. This can be a fat emboli, air emboli. Um, it can go into the branches and block off. So if you have something blocking off that branch, whenever you're trying to get that oxygen into that alveolar sac, it can't go. So if it can't go, carbon dioxide can't go, and carbon dioxide is just going to stay and hang out in the blood. So that can cause problems. So anything blocking in the lungs can cause those issues. And the other S, spasms of the bronchial tubes, this is asthma. Whenever a patient has an asthma attack, these bronchial tubes start spasming, which is blocking, again, just like the emboli, the gas exchange. The and what is going to happen is that that patient, whenever they're having that, they're not taking those nice deep breaths, and they're building up that CO2. Okay, and the last S, this is another, this is another important S, um, this, what is happening with this is that you have the sac elasticity of the alveolar sac is damaged. And what's happened is that this sac is damaged either because of a disease process called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, or emphysema. And what happens is whenever this sac is damaged, it's usually due to smoking. So that's why healthcare providers really encourage patients to quit smoking because they take in the smoke, the smoke goes through the lungs and it damages those sacs. And what happens is that the sac becomes damaged and it doesn't properly deflate. So whenever it doesn't properly deflate, it retains CO2. That's why you'll hear patients who are COPD patients, they're CO2 retainers because that sac is not deflating properly and it's keeping all that carbon dioxide. Now, let's look at the signs and symptoms, the nursing interventions, and work an arterial blood gas problem and show you what a patient with respiratory acidosis would look like. Okay, how does your patient present and look whenever they're in respiratory acidosis? Normally, this is going to start to happen gradually, and you'll start to see a neuro decline, neuro changes. All of a sudden, they'll become confused, maybe not answer your questions appropriately, and they'll just nod off and fall asleep. I remember I um, had a patient one time, he was starting to go into this, and he, we would be talking, and all of a sudden, he would literally fall asleep right in front of my face. And we checked his ABG levels, and sure enough, he was in respiratory acidosis. So really watch your neuro part. Um, also, the patient may say, I just have a headache, and then they're confused and they're drowsy. That should send a red flag too. And of course, respiratory depression. They're going to have a really slow respiratory rate, less than 12 breaths per minute. So make sure as a nurse you're counting those respirations appropriately and monitoring those. And have low blood pressure as well. Okay, so what do you typically do for a patient who is in respiratory acidosis? Um, of course, you'll contact the doctor. They'll give you a lot of orders on what to do, but typically this is what's going to happen. You're going to administer oxygen, and if the patient is alert enough, you're going to encourage coughing and deep breathing, helping them take those full deep breaths in and out. Because remember, we want them to expel that carbon dioxide that's built up. So we want them to be taking normal breaths at a rate of at least 12 to 20 breaths per minute. And if the patient has been having asthma attacks, COPD, or emphysema, a respiratory treatment might be good. So get respiratory therapy involved to give them a treatment, help with that, bronchodilators, because remember in asthma you have bronchoconstriction, and that'll help open them up and so they can breathe proper, properly and have that gas exchange go so they can expel that carbon dioxide. And also, if your patient is in this, a lot of times um, narcotics will cause this. Morphine, fentanyl, even Lortabs, things like that. Anything that's an opiate or a sedative like Valium, things like that can cause respiratory depression. So you'll want to hold those medications. Don't want to give those because it will make it worse. Now, remember this. This is very, very, very important. Watch potassium levels with respiratory acidosis. We talked about this in the hyperkalemia fluid and electrolyte series um, because this will cause an increase of your potassium levels, anything greater than 1.5. So you want to watch that. Whenever you get hyperkalemia involved, you start, you need to watch for any EKG changes that's associated with hyperkalemia, which are tall T waves, the flat P waves, or a prolonged QRS and PR interval. So watch for any of that. Now, if the patient has pneumonia, you'll be giving um, 
antibiotics encourage incentive spirometer usage so they can breathe in, pop those sacs open, which have the mucus and the pus in them, so you can help gas exchange. And um, if it's really, really bad, um, if it, the CO2 level, whenever you draw your blood gas, if it's greater than 50, the doctor may order the patient to have endotracheal intubation. So um, prepare the patient for this or if they're in respiratory distress. So that is the nursing interventions for that. Now let's work a problem that will show you how to do a blood gas problem on a nursing exam or the NCLEX because this is what nursing professors love to ask you whenever they're going over acid base imbalances. They're going to throw some ABG values out, out at you and they're going to give you some options and you have to decide what it is. So I like to do the ABG, I mean the tic-tac-toe method whenever I'm solving ABG problems. I have several, two videos on where I go in depth on how to use the tic-tac-toe method, setting up your problem and solving that. A card should pop up, a link should be in the description as well, so you can watch that video on how to do that. Okay, so here's what the problem says. Patient has the following ABGs, a PaCO2 level of 48, a pH of 7.25, a bicarb HCO3 level of 27. What condition is presenting? So we've got to go back to our chart that you have hopefully memorized. And you gotta remember what's acidotic, what's alkalotic. And you're gonna set up your tic-tac-toe. Remember as a child, we would play tic-tac-toe, so just set it up with your lines. Name one column base, one normal and, I mean one acid, one normal and one base. Now we are going to plug these values in um, to whether it's an acid or a base. So let's take it one by one. Okay, PaCO2, 48. Okay, we're thinking back to our table. We know that 35 to 45 is a normal PaCO2 level. And anything greater than 45 is acidotic. So we're going to put P. A CO2 here because it's an acid and then we're gonna look at our pH okay we know that a normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45 anything less than 7.35 is an acid so we're gonna put pH under acid okay we got a tic-tac-toe right here is our tic-tac-toe three in a row so we know that we are dealing with a respiratory problem. That right there tells us in our tic-tac-toe. Another reason tic-tac-toe is great is because you're trying to figure out if you're dealing with a respiratory or metabolic problem. That's the whole issue with these ABGs for a lot of students. Okay, now we're gonna look at our bicarb. And the, the last part, whenever after you get your tic-tac-toe, the one that's in the other column, you're gonna be looking at that and you're gonna be saying to yourself, okay, is this the body, based on this value, is this compensating? fully, is it partially compensating or is it not compensating at all? So let's look at it. Our bicarb is 27. So we know a normal bicarb is 22 to 26 and it's abnormal, it's 27. According to that, our chart, it is basic. So we're gonna put it over here. So remember at the beginning of this lecture, we talked about how whenever there's a buildup of CO2 in the lungs, the kidneys are gonna to try to fix this by releasing bicarb, HCO3. So the levels are going to increase abnormally. Why? Because it wants to bring that pH down. And this is what we're seeing. So the body is trying to compensate. So we got some compensation going on here. So we know we have respiratory acidosis and it's compensated, but is it fully or partially compensated? So this is where you've got to think. Okay, it's 27. Now, what's the purpose of bicarb trying to increase? The purpose is because it wants to bring that pH back to a normal level. Right now, our pH is not normal. It is still acidic. So it's just partially compensated. So if it would fully compensated, the pH would be back to normal. So this is respiratory acidosis partially compensated. Okay, so that is about respiratory acidosis. Now be sure to take that quiz to test your knowledge on the difference between respiratory alkalosis and acidosis. And thank you so much for watching and be sure to check out my other teaching tutorials and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.